Hello everyone and welcome back to Ewan's Buzz. Today we're going to be building something. Something pretty cool I might add. So you're probably wondering what are we going to be building? Well, we're going to build a function generator. Now this doesn't look like the regular function generator you'd see in a lab or some or a hobbyist workshop. This is a function generator kit, as you can see, the little board there, and it's got a whole bunch of goodies and instructions on how to build it. So I would it would be awesome if I could just build one out of my head, but I'm not that advanced yet. Keyword there, yet. So let's take a closer look at this on the bench. Okay, so you guys were probably wondering, well, what was in the bag? So let me show you. So here are all the little parts and goodies that we're going to be using to build the amp. So it's got the chips. Oh, and that's nice. The chip also comes with a socket. We'll take a look at all of these little components in more detail soon. It also came in another bag, a little case. It's actually quite a nice case, I'm not going to lie. So it came with a case that we can use as well. And it does not seem to be damaged, like as in cracked or broken from being shipped. So we've got a nice little case here as well. And here's our circuit board where everything is going to go onto. And it should, if the camera might focus, there we go. It should give us all the labels for the different values of parts that we need to put on here. Then we've got this little instruction manual. Uh, let's see if it even is an instruction manual. Um, well, it's sort of an instruction manual. It tells you what there is and, you know, just stuff like that. Let me zoom out so you can see this just a tad bit better. There we go. That's all it is. It's got a schematic here, um, all the components that it should come with. And these look like some sort of instructions, so I'll have to read through them just now. But don't worry, I will maybe at the end of the video put a picture of this little manual up uh, just so you can, you can see what there is. I don't know how well it's focused, but I'll, I'll make a nice scan of it so you can see at the end of the video. And you can just pause the video at the end to see what was on here. So that's all our parts. Let's get a closer look at all of our little electronic goodies. Okay, so these are all the components. So this is the pride of this, um, this little function generator. It is the chip. Let me read you the number on it. So it's quite long. It's an XR226CP. That's the chip, and I think that is responsible for doing all of the function generating. These are just the passive components that will be used to manage the outputs and inputs. So we've got some resistors here. We've got some jumpers here and jumper headers. We've also got some screws. Now I think these screws will be used to hold the board in the case, but I honestly don't quite know. We've got some electrolytic capacitors here, these little guys. And we've got some variable resistors, some knobs, which I know aren't really electronic components. I just thought they'd look good there as well. So we've also got a little DC jack, um, some regular cable, I don't know what you call those things, uh, cable terminals? Yeah, it sounds about right. And then we've also got some tantalum capacitors. I think that's also what they're called as well. So these are all our little parts. Let's put them together. Now, I am going to be putting them together uh, on a time lapse because this may take a while and I'm sure you don't want to see me going, mm, solder, 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 it will get boring. So I'm going to take a time lapse of me putting this all together. And before I do that though, I'm just going to give you a few tips before we start on that. So tip number one, do not solder these capacitors in reverse polarity or as in the negative is on the positive side and the negative side is on the positive side. You don't want to do that because those capacitors will explode. And you also, whenever you solder, you want to make sure you have a clean tip. And when I was recently reading on Weller's website, they recommend if your tip is dirty and the, uh, the wet sponge is not doing it for you, just take some steel wool like this and that, and you just rub your soldering iron on there, not hard, just to get the dirt off, and it works really well. 
I recently did that for my soldering iron. And as you can see, the tip looks pretty good. So you can use that to clean your soldering iron, but otherwise, I do recommend you put all of the components on the board first, make sure it's all right, and then solder. So that's all the tips I have for you right now, and I will stop in the middle of the time lapse if there are any other tips that I can give you. But let's get building. Okay, so putting that together took a little bit longer than I expected it to because uh, the instructions did help a lot but there was a few spots where I just needed to double check so that's why in the time lapse you saw me a lot of the time with this pencil and scribbling on the schematics which are here but the nice thing is you get a schematic and you, you just get a whole lot of stuff which really does help as you can see here so we have been drawing just so I know which components go where just to double check that I'm right, because I don't want it to go wrong. And also, all the resistors, they use the blue type of resistors instead of using resistors that kind of look like this. So it was a lot harder to see the values on them. So, you know, if I put my hand behind it, it might focus. But you see these little, little like dots or lines on the resistor. Let's see if I can get it to focus on the resistor. Okay, maybe not, but you see all these little lines, they determine the value of the resistor and it's really hard to see on these little blue resistors what color those lines are because they're very dependent on what the color is. So what I've done is I went and just sat down with my multimeter over here and I just probed all the resistors just, just to be sure that I knew I was putting the ones where I needed to. So now everything is done, hey? Uh, all the components are in and ready to be soldered. Now, this is sort of how it's gonna look. I haven't put the main chip in because you know you have to just give it some time or you don't wanna solder it while the chip is in there because you risk damaging the chip. And this is how the back looks. Now, all of these really long leads I'm going to cut after I've soldered. It's just so all the components will stay in the board, if you know what I'm saying. So. Let's solder it. done. So the soldering is all done as you can see on the bottom here. Let me turn this around. The soldering is all done. And yeah, some of my solder joints don't look amazing, but at least they're, you know, they're usable. So now, since I've got such a close-up of this board, let me get it centered, uh, we're going to check for short circuits in our, on our board. So as you can see, there are many little spots that are very close together. That is why we need to check for shorts. So I'm going to get a nice tiny little screwdriver and we're going to take a look. So it's mainly these close areas that we need to focus on, especially in between these. So here it looks all good and especially up here, here and here, just need to focus on those areas. But so far everything looks fine, but look here. 
there is a little spot here that's a little bit suspect. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some wire cutters and we're going to try and just trim it a little bit. So there we go, much better. And we'll do the same with the other ones that are just a bit too long. So the things that I was clipping off in the time lapse were the leads from the little components. The reason why I was clipping them off is because um, if they were long like that, they could short it out. So that's the reason why I was mainly clipping them off. So we're going to have to clip off this one as well. And so the reason why I just blew on the board there is because you don't want any metal shavings or, you know, from the little bits that we cut off to get inside there, like little bits like, um, like this, let me move that, like, like that. You don't want that, but that's a bit big, but I'm talking like tiny, tiny little bits of metal. We don't want that to get in between all the little components. So now everything looks good. So let's flip it over and we're going to install the chip. But one thing that before we install the chip, if you look here, you can see, I'll grab my little screwdriver, this is the chip holder or the socket, I think they call it. And you're probably wondering, how do I know which way it's meant to go on? So there's a notch here, as you can see, and that notch has got an outline of this chip holder on the board, but there's also a notch in that outline. So when you're soldering it to the board, I don't know if you can slightly see it there, but when you're soldering it to the board, you need to line up the notch with the chip holder and the board. You need to line it up and then you know that it's good. So let's put this little board down and put it there. Let's get our little chip. And as you can see on here, the chip also has a tiny notch like that. Hopefully the camera will focus. There we go. The chip has also got a little notch. And you just need to make sure that all these little notches are all lined up like so. So you're going to take the chip out of its protective uh, foam. And then here's our little chip and we're going to make sure it's all lined up correctly. And you might need to bend the pins just a tiny bit just to get the chip to fit in a little bit easier. But once you've done that, it should just pop in. You're going to have to watch me struggle for a bit. But I really want you guys to see how the chip goes in to the socket. Okay, so I'm going to have to bend the pins a little bit more. And when you do bend the pins, you have to bend them inwards. Just You should know that because if you bend them outwards, it's not really going to work, is it? So it's mainly these ones that are giving me issues, these ones on this end. So now let's give it a try. There we go. And voila! Our chip is in. So now I'm going to read in the manual what voltages runs at and we're going to break out the bag of power supplies. You'll see what that is in a moment. And we'll find a suitable power supply to hopefully power this up. So give me a moment and let's get the rest of the equipment all set up. Okay, so I've checked the manual and it says here it uses 9 to 12 volts. So if you it also says if you supply more than 12 volts, uh, the waveform will be unstable. So let's get the bag of power supplies and see if we can find a nice 12 volt power supply. So this is the bag of switch mode power supplies. Let me zoom that out a bit more. And yeah, so there are a lot of power supplies in here. Like, I mean a lot. There's a computer power supply. And some of these power supplies I still use. I just put them all in a bag because it was easier that way instead of keeping them with whatever machine that they went with. So this uh, 5 volts DC won't work. What one's this? Also 5 volts. But there is a whole lot of power supplies in here. So give me a moment while I try to find one that will work. Okay, so I found two power supplies in the box, both with uh, barrel connectors, so that's good. This one is 9 volts at 500 milliamps. 
Whereas this one, it's a Netgear one from a router. Honestly, don't know if I still have the router. But this one is 12 volts at 1.5 amps. So I'm thinking we should just use the 9 volt one, but we'll compare between the two to see which one works better. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this little guy uh, in its case. So I'll just move those and we're going to put this in its case. And then hopefully we're going to connect some wires up to this and we're going to test it. But now you're probably thinking, how are we going to test it? Well, I've got an awesome piece of kit that we're going to use to test it. It is called an oscilloscope and you're going to see a whole lot of it right now. So I've got everything set up and this is the oscilloscope I was talking about. It is a Telequipment D61A. It is an absolutely beautiful scope and the CRT is just so, so clear. It is absolutely lovely. So I tested the power supply to make sure it's working and it is. So I've got the 9 volts here. Let's see if it plugs in. Yep, it does. So now let's connect the oscilloscope to the outputs of our little function generator. So I've set it to 1 to 10 Hertz and we're going to use the sine wave first, you know, just to give it a try we want to use the sine wave. And it's actually not powered on yet so there's just some interference in the background. Okay, so it's on. Or seems to be. So let's see what this does. Okay. Just going to have to do some adjustments on the scope. Okay. Interesting. Ooh. Okay, so let's undo that. Okay, so this is awfully confusing. Let's see what. Oh, maybe I should set it to DC. Okay, maybe not. Okay, AC it is. Channel 1, we've got it set to. Hmm. So, it's doing something, but I don't quite know what. Alright, so I'll pause the video here, and we'll see what, what happens. I'll try to get this to work, so give me a moment. Okay, so it seems like I've gotten it working. It turns out it did not like the 9 volt power supply, so I just plugged in the 12 volt one, and seems to be working fine. So this is a uh, hundred to three kilohertz, a uh, hundred hertz to three kilohertz I think this one is. But look let's check this out. So now you can see a whole lot more, a whole lot less and this is a triangle wave. And now let's look at a sine wave. So here's a sine wave this just to a spot where it will stay still. There we go. Hold on. There we are. So that's a little bit distorted but there we go. And there is a sine wave. So our little frequency generator seems to be working. Which I find that pretty cool that we built this little frequency generator. Now let's go a little bit higher. We're going to have to recalibrate it again. Let's see what it does once we've recalibrated it. There we go. So now this is an even higher. Okay, it's still a little bit... There we go. Oh, okay. So that is also still a sine wave, 
it's just at a higher frequency. So we can make it bigger, and hopefully we can stop it, because it's loving to move. But there we go, that's a bit better, but you can't really see that, can you? Let me zoom in the camera to the oscilloscope screen, and we can take a look on what we might see. So this is it's still a sine wave, it's a 3 kilohertz to 65 kilohertz, which is quite cool. I, what if you do it like this? That makes me curious. Don't know. Okay, that does nothing. So that is quite low, a little bit higher. Aha! There is a sine wave as well, so I can make it less flickery. There we go. So there's still a sine wave. Let's change it to a triangular wave. So, it's got to do some adjustments. There we go. And there is a triangular wave. Now don't quote me on what this is called because the ratios are a bit confusing on this, uh, you know, on this little case. But I still haven't managed to figure out the square wave. Like, if you look at the square wave, I don't know if that's right. I don't think it is. So I haven't managed to figure that out yet. I don't know if maybe there's a specific way to connect it or something. But as you can see, they all just look... Yeah, but I, I think there should be a line there. I honestly don't quite know because I'm still learning with the oscilloscope and this is just sort of basic oscilloscope stuff that I'm doing now. But if we change it over back to our regular sine wave, we can get a nice sine wave. I need to give it a little bit of, make an art here. Interesting, okay. Now, let's set it here and see what we get. But I'm sure you guys basically get the gist of it. There's a triangular wave. Now we can convert it back to a sine wave, like so. And to make it bigger, what we're going to do is we're going to increase the voltage or the sensitivity on the scope. We can move that there, and there you go. So now we can reduce it, and voila. Now you've got a sine wave, and I think this is the frequency, I think, I honestly don't quite know. But there you go, that is the mini frequency generator kit that we just built together. So I think this was a pretty cool learning experience and it's always nice to have a little frequency generator on hand. I don't know what I'll use it for, I'll, I'm sure I'll figure out something to use it for. But I hope you enjoyed this video. And I will see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.